The Women's Football World Cup is about to kick off with around three quarters of a million tickets sold for the event in France. And big name sponsors lining up to get involved. Is this a breakthrough moment for the women's game? The semis and the final are already sold out. The players are ready to perform on the biggest stage as the Women's World Cup gets underway in France. Until now, the beautiful game has been dominated by men's teams. But is women's football beginning to catch up? 24 teams, more than 550 players and one priceless trophy. The 2019 Women's World Cup is beginning in France. Until now, experts say the game's development has been stifled by a lack of media exposure, but that is starting to change. There are predictions that the tournament could reach 1 billion TV viewers around the world. And big-name sponsors are getting involved in women's football, seeing an opportunity to reach new audiences. The main backer of this World Cup, a global credit card company, says it wants the top players to become household names. The winning team will bank $4 million, and the overall prize fund has been doubled to $30 million. But perhaps the biggest reward on offer from this tournament will be global recognition for the women's game. So time to talk to our guests. And joining us at the round table today is Naomi Feltham, a former semi-professional footballer, Jane Purden, Chief Executive of Women in Football, which works to promote women's involvement in all levels of the game. We have Sophie Lawson, a women's football journalist. And Paula Bloodworth, Brand Strategy Director at ad agency Wyden and Kennedy. Well, thank you all for joining us here today at Roundtable. What's interesting is we have brought with us a complete representation of the wide society that already exists and is in place. Careers being built uh, behind women's football that to anyone new to the game, would be quite surprised to see all the experience we've got just gathered here. Jane, if I could start with you. Uh, so, France 2019, this is supposed to be the big one. This is the, this is the turning point. This is the seminal moment. Why this time around? Why 2019? Well, I think short answer to your, your first question, is this the breakthrough moment? Yes, I think it is. I think for a while I felt not, ha will women's football be big. I think the question is actually how big is it going to be and that's the really interesting and exciting question. We didn't just get here out of nowhere, there's been a lot of people working really hard for many years to grow and develop the women's game, uh, to support it in various countries around the world. But, but what seems to have changed now and what I'm feeling is a sudden buzz and excitement from the wider world, uh, from fans, from media and broadcasters, and certainly a lot of commercial interest as well. So, something has changed and something is different. And I feel the, the, the time just feels right. I think France are going to put on a great World Cup because they're superb at organising these great sporting organisations. It feels like it's a very open World Cup as well, which is adding to the excitement. So we shall see. But I think everybody's got fingers crossed this is going to be a big one. I mean, I mean Sophie, for any kind of national competition or international competition to take place and, and be the spectacle everyone wants it to be, there has to be a whole network of grassroots work that's gone into bringing that. Local clubs, youth teams, national teams, regional teams, all these things. These have all been going on for some time now around the world. That's quite a journey to bring it to what people are hoping will be offered to the fans this time round. I mean, it's the, it's the same as with, you'd, you'd get in men's football. But it's, I think we are seeing, as, as Jane said, it's, it's, it's growing. It's growing everywhere. And, and you'd see now, if you go back a few years, you know, I think there's four members of the Lioness squad won the, uh, the under-19s a few years back. Here. It must have been 10 years ago now. Uh, sorry, the under-17s. You know, they're... Then, then getting to the World Cup was just a dream for them. Now they're living the reality. And that's, that's just in England. It's, it's happening all over the world. It's, but it's uh, what incredible. we're seeing, though, is when on the international stage, such accomplished athletes, that to the fans, if they're new to the sport, they think, well, these people have been doing this a while. When in, in actual fact, the professionalism is, is so new in, in the sport, you, you wouldn't think it. And you've got sort of members of the Scotland team, the, uh, only, the, the home base members have only been training since January with a full-time schedule. And you can already see the, the effects and that they look stronger, they look better, they look 
more like the professional athletes that they've always dreamed of being. Well, Naomi, that's a journey that you're familiar with. Give us a taste of what that's, li that's like. Yeah, so for me, um, I played for West Ham United Ladies all through my youth years. And obviously living in Essex, it was the local club and it was an honour really to play for them. However, when you get to 16, at the time there was no real step from youth to women's football. And that was, what, 10 years ago now. And so, you know, you, you hit 16 and if you were good enough, you're put in the first team, which is not just for West Ham, for any club. And you're playing against 25 to 30 year old women coming and clattering you on a, on a Sunday morning. And, you know, and it just wasn't a, a pr preparation thing at all. There was no step. You, you never trained with the first team. You never really, you met them and it was like, wow, this is amazing. Whereas, and so for me, I had the opportunity to go and play in America. And at the time, America was the place to be. They were putting money into it. They were pounding money into it almost. And I had the opportunity to play in California for two years and in North Carolina for two years. And at that point, you showed up on day one of pre-season and you'd have a locker full of, of kit and everything and boots and shoes and bags. And, and that was never, ever the case here. My mum and dad would always have to fund my subs and my travel. We'd, we'd, we'd drive to Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, you name it. We were there playing tournaments, games every Sunday. And, and, it, and now it, there's something there and it's so exciting for young, for young girls and, and young women as well to, to aspire to that. And there's, that they feel like there's something to work towards where unfortunately at that point, for me and my age group, there wasn't that quite, you know, you always knew that you'd have to work part-time and be, have football part-time. And that, that's, which is, I just think it's amazing now because, you know, although I was, I kind of missed out on that, that spot, which was fine. I know that I've got nieces that will will love football and they will have that opportunity to go and play when they get to 16. They'll be and they'll be around the first team. How did, how did you feel that headwind, that 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 resistance to you progressing? Was it lack of facilities? Was there a gap? It's in the tough. Lack of funds was the biggest thing yeah. uh, because you you were only training twice a week and they had they didn't cover any of your travel costs. And for families that were on a lower income or had other children in, involved in the family. You, your one parent couldn't commit to take you all over the country every weekend, you know, and it, and it was tough. And luckily, I was very fortunate that I had a dad who could literally drive me all over. My mum would be at home with my brothers. However, there wasn't there wasn't that opportunity there then. And you know, subs were expensive. You know, you were you were paying for a, at the time, Umbro was sponsoring West Ham, and it was a very expensive kit then. You know, and it was tough. And and you never really got to interact with with the players. You you never ever trained where the, where the men trained ever. You were always at a separate ground. Where now it's all integrated. And I think it's fabulous. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's a classic, sort of, to me, that's a classic story of, a, of the, the early days of something, mm. Mm. you know, gradually piecing itself together and identifying where mm. people are dropping out when perhaps they shouldn't do, mm. or, you know, falling away from careers that otherwise have gone a lot further, mm. which presumably that's the focus of your attention is to make sure that, that those holes are plugged. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, we've gone from the FA banning the women's game that, that was the case while I was alive to the FA a couple of weeks ago, working with ourselves, women in football, committing to offer football to every school girl in England to give them that opportunity. So, so I think the FA are absolutely on it in this country. Uh, they, they are hugely committed to the game. They're, they're, they're very keen to plug these gaps. And it's difficult because we've got to be honest, women's football isn't yet profitable. It doesn't yet wash its face. This involves a huge commitment and spend by the FA and by clubs such as West Ham, who you're, you're absolutely right, they're one of many who've, who've upped their game. Um, not every club can, can afford to stay in that particular race. Um, and, and while it's fantastic to see, uh, I think one of the next challenges is to put the game on a sustainable footing. And that's where commercial partners are, and, and broadcasters and fan interests are, are so important. Which brings us to Paula, of course. Clearly, some are looking out there and thinking, good to get in early on this because this is going places and we should be visible on it. So there are various notable companies now that are not only sponsoring, but pledging, openly pledging their, their kind of presence in the game. That presumably means that the money now smells potential in the whole, in the whole spectacle of women's football. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wish there were more. I still, I still think there's not enough actually coming in. But yeah, I think a lot of brands are actually getting involved and it's really smart to do it early and incredibly good value for money when you think about it because the, the sponsorships are still cheap, but you actually create a connection with the consumers and you get in early on something that, that means something and, and you're creating the future, um, which is really smart of brands like Barclays and Visa and, and Nike and all those sort of brands. 
uh, looking at those companies you mentioned and others, Procter and Gamble, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Lucas Aid. Lucas Aid. All the marketing directors are women. I noticed uh, looking at it. It's a good so trend there, isn't it? <laughs> so you know, you've got friends in the right places at the moment. Yeah, yeah. You can. See, I mean, it's like the women's football. You can see things pushing through, and the leadership positions are important to actually push this change. Um, and and we are getting more briefs in the agency, and more brands coming to us saying, "How do we get involved in this in the right way?" Because we don't want people just jumping on the bandwagon either. We don't want people going, "Oh, women's sport is suddenly popular. Let's just throw an ad out there and and then go dead after." It. So it's important brands actually invest and, and um, yeah, invest in the future and, and align themselves authentically with what women's football is. So Sophie, as a commentator of all this over the last few decades, um, when the players will come out to start another match and you notice that the, the stands are a bit fuller or the, the signs are slightly sort of slightly more pucker companies, do you think, oh, Luna, this is another great move forward, this is going to be another great game and more people are, are, are looking at it and I'm witnessing the growth of something that's going to go even further. Of course, but I think it, it's almost like, um, it's, it's almost, I mean, it might be offensive to some, it's almost like trying to watch your hair grow. It's Sometimes it's so small you don't see it happening and then suddenly you need to go to the hairdresser. It's because it's right. gone so big. And do you think that France 2019 is one of those moments where you think, oops, it's time for a haircut? Absolutely. I think we're all going to be pretty shaggy by the end of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny what you mentioned uh, before um, about the United States is that, Something, I, I may be wrong, but I, I got the impression that the women's football in the United States is way more sophisticated than the men's football. One million percent. It always has been. It's just, you know, I played college football or college soccer, as they call it, and we had more fans at our games than any of the men's games because we, we you know, we reached conference tournaments finals. And you look at, the, you know, the Division One top level teams like the North Carolinas and the and um, the other big teams, you know, they, they were having thousands of fans at their games, but the men weren't even close to that. And it's just amazing how they encourage the sport over there. And it is the biggest women's sport in the country, in America, by a long way. And it, it always has been, but now it's, oh, it's just fabulous over there. I absolutely love it. I, I did want to talk about home sports, you know, <clears throat> Australian rules, football, all these other things that people compete against in their own <clears throat> national arenas. But of course, I suppose in the States, those two sports are very, very much divided between men and women. Women are not going to play NFL. No. Exactly. Um, probably not that much baseball, I don't know. No, very. it was softball, but it's not very common, yeah. So was it a, was soccer somewhere for, for, for women to go? Yeah, very a much so, and they encourage it in high school all the time. They, and they have what they call travel, travel teams, and it's like basically a Sunday league team, but they travel all over the country and they get picked up by scouts. And the ultimate goal in America is to get picked up for a college scholarship, and that's the aim. And, you know, they're signing students at age 14, you know, for, for uni at 18 over there because they, they just want to pick them up quickly. And that's where, that's where the difference is, you know. And at the time, you know, I had a few friends who went over to America and played, all of the same age group as me, simply because there wasn't the step here. We didn't feel like we had a progression and a career. And why not go over there? You know, you get a full scholarship to get all your tuition covered. You get to travel the country, meet amazing people, get coached at a top, top level. And, you know, and just have the most amazing time and I think we are slowly starting to get this here now where you know you are more involved and there's money and it, it it's brilliant and even at the time when I went the Super League wasn't even a thing then it, it only was founded I think two years after I left for the States so now you know pe people are joining these clubs you know Manchester United started the Super League last year they've got promoted this year it's brilliant I played for Durham for a year in the Super League too they have over 500 fans coming to games sometimes up there it's brilliant it's the biggest club in the northeast and it's just fabulous. Paul, is, is there a model there for others to look at in terms of how you generate enthusiasm and therefore funding and therefore filling stadiums and so on with how the American dynamic has played out, how American male soccer has really struggled, to be honest, um, whereas the female game has completely taken off, the women's game has completely taken off because of a different kind of energy, a different kind of sense of opportunity, perhaps? Yeah, I think it is different in America because the men's team has struggled, so the women have had an opportunity to really shine. And it's a different challenge here. Like the men's teams in the, the men's game is always dominated, so how do you find a role for women's sport? And I think, you know, the women's and men's game is slightly different and we need to celebrate those differences and actually champion them. And I think that's where branding and advertising can tell those stories and engage and actually create money and funding. It's, it's about breaking the cycle. And I think that's where advertising can actually have a huge role. Because the Australian team as well, the Matildas. Matildas, yeah. They Sam Kerr. brought out a calendar <laughs> rather famously and so on. That, that was clearly <clears throat> coming from a place of, you know, it's time to be proud of ourselves yeah. and make ourselves known and, and put that out there. And, you know, there's no harder competition to get attention than there is in the world of established sport in Australia, surely. Yeah, I mean, I, I go the Aussies, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, 
that, I think that's a similar situation as the men's game is, is not very strong there. Like you, we, the, when you look at the men's game in the World Cup, you don't think they're going to have a chance. But this year you do, you feel like a tingling feeling that the, the women's team might actually have a, have a go. And you've got characters like Kerr, you know, who are actually um, really incredible role models for the next generation. And, and that's the other exciting thing as well, is role models um, to look up to. So in terms of the spectacle itself, um, there's, there's the funding, there's the enthusiasm, there's the novelty value as well. What are we going to go and see if we're going to go and see a game of professional women's football? If we go and see, if we go and see a regular Premiership game, we're going to see our favourite players a bit. We're going to see the game played well. We're going to follow a particular team that we might be obsessed about. Those are the kind of the three ingredients I sort of identify, uh, hopefully rightly, in a kind of Premier. What, what are the, what are the what are the draws for the women's game? All the same things, or it, it's, it can't just be a copy of the. It's it's not quite the same, but it's you'll see. You'll see less diving for, for a start. <laughs> you'll, you'll see less of the, the histrionics. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's, it's football. Uh, you know, it's the idea that it's different, but it's also, it's also the same. And you'll get to know the players. And you'll get, to, you'll get your favourite players. And, and you'll learn about the stories and you'll pick up the threads. And you can follow it just like you can men's football. It's, it's still 90 minutes. It's still trying to get a ball in a goal. You know, it's... Yeah, when we spoke, like we've done a lot of interviews of, of athletes, I think that's something they stress as well, is like, don't compare us to the men's. Yeah. Like, celebrate the women's game for what it is, and, I, and we need to actually do that in, in, in all ways. And yes, it's, it, it's the same game, it's football, but it's played very differently, and that's wonderful. We don't want to just copy the men's all the time. No, presumably, the, the approach from the fans and the sponsors and the kind of television contracts that will inevitably follow, that, that'll have a different sense to it, a different flavour to it. It's not just a repetition I think of, the, of the men's game. I think if you go to women's, a top women's football game and you will see this in the World Cup in France and you'll see it on your TV screens, you will see some of the greatest footballers currently playing any gender. And I absolutely take the point, male football's not the comparator. It's absolutely not. If you're a young girl dreaming about how good you can be, you, you don't want to hear you'll never be as good as the men because you never will be. The, the, the biology is, is what it is. Um, we want to be judged against each other on the playing field. Um, but what I think also is wonderful, which goes to go match your question about women's football right now, is that there is still a kind of innocence and freshness about it. Um, people say things, you know, like there's less diving. They, people are often struck when they go even to women's Super League matches in this country, the top tier, that the, the players will wander over and speak to the fans afterwards. There's a, a much greater engagement between fans and players. Um, and that, I think, makes it very attractive. Um, on top of it being just superb football. If you're a football fan and you watch a top women's game, you'll, you'll soon forget who you're watching and you'll just be absorbed in the fact you're watching amazing football. Naomi, listen to all this. What, 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 how does it make you feel? I mean, because this was your life. Yeah. And you've moved on. And obviously it's going, it's, it's building a, a dynamic of its own. How does it make you feel hearing it's about It's exciting in some ways because I, I couldn't think of anything better for the younger generation, you know, with family members who I know that they love football and they could go, and the, the thought of them playing at that level is just so exciting for me. However, I do miss it a lot, you know, and seeing how it's progressed now and, you know, and the, 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 money, the money in it is, is, is increasing, which is fabulous because that was always a, an issue at the time. But it's just, it's very, very exciting. I really, I really believe that it, it's going in the right direction. And although I can't commit, Due to you know, I, I had the choice at the time: do I pick a career or do I do I go back to football? And I, I chose the career. However, there are women that I know that play in WSL two and WSL one who have committed and are just having the best time. And the and the the play there's such a good team cohesion in women's football, and everybody has each other's backs. You know, and what happens on the pitch stays on the pitch, and you come away and you interact and you have great team bonding sessions, and they're all posting on social media and interacting with their fans. And you don't really get that much in the men's game because they're at a totally different level. You know, that they're like celebrities almost. Whereas, well, that that whole kind of um, community feel to it—that's a different dynamic for a start, isn't it? In terms of the two different games. One hundred percent, yeah. And you go there, and as you say, the, the players actually hang back after the game, and they they feel a responsibility to actually stay back and sign every single little girls and little boys and, and families, you know, signature on everything because it is a sense of community and, and it's more of a family gathering. It's a much more open and warm kind of environment. Do you think that'll make, Sophie, do you think that'll make it different for the women who've already moved into the men's game in terms of commentating, reporting for news and so on and so forth? What they've learned to do, the languages they've learned to speak in order to 
communicate the men's game to an audience, do you think that's a different job, a good different career path to the one that you're following? In terms of the language we use, that I think is, is universal no matter what in, in football. Offside is, is still offside no matter if it's, a, if, if, if it's a man or a woman. But there is definitely a difference in the culture between men, men and women's uh, football. And that might be, I think that is something that uh, the women that get into the men's game, no matter if they're former players or wherever they've come from, they have to brace themselves for. Yes, I mean, I think we could probably uh, agree that one big change in the men's game was television rights. When, mm -hmm. when, when TV really got involved and saw, saw an opportunity in that, that changed a lot of the dynamic of how the, the mm -hmm. football, football games are played. That's on the horizon, I suppose, for the women's game. Do you think that's going to bring changes or pressures even? Yeah, so I, um, I worked in male, male professional football for many years. And in fact, my career kind of coincided with that coming in. So I saw those changes. And when I look at the women's game now, again, I think the question we need to be asking ourselves, or one of the questions is, what is the future governance of this game going to be? And in what ways can we learn from male professional football? And in what ways, looking at some of the special things we have, do we kind of nurture, cherish and protect those and keep them? And are there things we can and should do differently? And that's the conversation that I think we should have because it's always a balance. I, I said earlier, women's football is loss-making at the moment, and it is. Who knows, this World Cup may break even, may even make a profit. And we need to change that because the game needs to be sustainable. Uh, so it, it, we need more revenue coming in. But equally, we need to make sure that as revenue comes in, so all that, one, all those wonderful things we love, like the innocence, the freshness, the immediacy, the contact, that, that they're not lost. And some of the things I've seen in male professional football in my career, and again, I love the game. It's been very kind to me. I'm a huge fan. But I have seen challenges around agents, third-party ownership, mysterious money flows, this kind of thing. I would hate to see that come into to the women's game. We have to be prepared for a lot in that, in that respect. I think <clears throat> the, the career path for the, for the, in the men's game, it's become clearer how, how much jeopardy there is in that career path. Uh, early retirement, redundancy often, or a sense of redundancy, yeah. pressures of wealth, of fame, of lack of fame, of, of winning and losing, all those sort of things. Mental health is something that's discussed a lot now in the, in the, male, in the, in the men's game. Uh, in terms of nurturing players and then looking after them once their best years are, are suddenly decided, perhaps not by them, that they're over. That's all perhaps waiting in the wings as well. I mean, you've seen the pressures, Naomi, of what people have to go through to make it up there. And then when they get there, there's a whole other challenge waiting for them as well. It's huge. And we, they, America were very, very good at that side of things. You know, you had on, on campus, you'd have a a mental health kind of department almost and then they'd be sitting with, with the physio and if you had any issues you know if you were in a big game and you know you you would you lost on penalties or something or you know you've got other things going on in your life there was someone to talk to and I don't know personally whether that's happening in the women's game at the moment because I'm not part of a club where that's going on however America are very strong at that and that and they understand that it, it's needed and it's it's a big part of the game it's huge you know Great. Um, Gareth Southgate talks about it all the time, you know, how he obviously in the world in the Men's World Cup when he struggled on penalties and he, and he started to bring it into the men's national team, you know, how get through the penalties and last year was fabulous when we beat <laughs> them on penalties for the first time. However, I think it, I, I do think it needs to be brought in. It's, it's a very, very important part of the game. And, and that women, are, women are emotionally different as well than men, you know, that we have other things going on in our lives. You know, some women have children, you know, and, and we just, we're, we're different biology, so. Uh, we, and we've seen all those factors in, our, in other women's sports, whether it's tennis or yeah. boxing or, or, or rowing or all the other Olympic sports, for example. But there, there will be a generation now who are at the top of their game, who are going to dazzle in this World Cup, who are probably approaching then a kind of a, a retirement from frontline sports, as it were, and it'll be interesting or perhaps even of concern to see what happens to their careers now. Yeah, definitely. I hope we can start building profiles around these athletes so that we can give them the decent sponsorship deals and, yeah. and actually create these, these heroes um, that they can go into, like, commentating or, you know, stay in the profession or go into coaching, you know, that, that once they haven't finished their career, it's not a dead end. Um, so I'm hoping the World Cup does that as well, not just bring fame to the game, but actually, you know, create a future for those people who are in there at the moment. Yeah, I mean, Sophie, that's obviously something that if you're going to get to know athletes along the road and see them progress from one place to the centre stage, and then what happens to them after that will be also be a message to others thinking of getting involved in the game. I think what, what we're seeing, what we've seen for many years in, in women's football is almost every woman who's played 
ever has has done a degree or, or education or has juggled a job at the same time. You, you can look at the best players in the world, at the best clubs in the world, they're still studying part-time so that they have a job to go into afterwards, you know, after they retire. Sometimes it's... You meet players and they say, "Oh yeah, no, I'm 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 a lawyer. I'm I, I'm an accountant." And you see, it's so different from the person they are on the pitch. But you know, it. I think it's up to the individual what they want to do after their playing career. Whereas I think in me, in male football, it's more football, 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 than more. Football. In a rush for the big time, I suppose. I think women look more at the big picture, especially because professionalism is so new. There's always what comes up. This will end at some point. I need a plan in place. Whereas I don't think many male footballers have that in mind. It's, I can make a lot of money in a short space of time. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much indeed. Imagine that we've actually run out of time already. <laughs> oh, wow. That was, uh, that was so great small. talking to you all. Thanks very much indeed uh, for coming in today and talking to us on uh, Roundtable. So thanks to all our guests. That is it for now, but you can always see more discussion, of course, and debate on our YouTube channel. Search TRT World Roundtable. But from me and the team now, goodbye.